Standing on the platform of truth. Pioneer Health and Missions. Good morning. morning. Blessed Sabbath to every one of you. Uh, Before, of course, we we dig um, into the Word of God, I'm going to invite you once again to kneel with me if you're able to. Dear Heavenly Father, Jehovah, we thank you for this blessed Sabbath day. I ask that you may speak to our hearts and that your word may fall on good ground and may produce fruit for life eternal. Thank you and I ask you these things in the name of your dear Son, Christ Jesus. Amen. I could have given this talk a different title, but because it's taken from one of the verses that I was reading to put together this talk, I chosen the title, The Men I Cry. Um, And perhaps as you read this title, you might think that I will be discussing the early history of the Adventist people. Um, that took place during the years of 1843-44. And while I will make reference to such history, the focus of this talk is to point you to some of the characteristics of, of this special class of people who, as it was in 1843 and 44, are found heralding the arrival of the bridegroom to the earth. So that's the point or the focus of this study, is to point you to those characteristics. And we'll begin. This is Matthew chapter 25. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. Here's a question. Does the above describe us as a whole? Does it? Have we all taken our Bibles and are on our way to meet the bridegroom? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. This describes us. However, a part is considered to be what? Wise, while the other is what? Foolish. Why? Well, what determines the class they belong to, we'll we'll look into that. But notice the following. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels. Oil is a symbol of what? Holy Spirit, okay? So therefore, in order to belong to the wise class, we must have Holy Spirit or the Spirit of God, okay? While the bridegroom tarried, how many slumbered and slept? All slumbered and slept. And at midnight, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out, to meet him. So apparently some, at least from what I read, were awake, and those that were awake sound the alarm, right? Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. What made the wise wise? Well, we find in Matthew chapter 26, I believe. Here, let me... Chapter 7, verse 24. Everyone, therefore, that hears the words of mine and doeth them shall be likened unto a wise man who built his house upon the rock. So what considers, what is this passage saying? 
that those who do the words of Christ are considered what? Wise. And I hope that as we continue to read from both the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, it is my desire and my prayer that we will actually walk and obey what we are going to learn today. And everyone that hears these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. So we started off by reading about the ten virgins. Five of them are wise, and the other five are what? Foolish. Those that actually obey and act out God's sayings are considered wise, while the other class that does not act out what God is saying is considered foolish. In James chapter 1, verse 23, we read, For if any be a hearer of the word, and not what? A doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. So here's the call. The call is to arise and shine. That's the call. Earlier as I walked in during Sabbath school, some things were mentioned that I will be touching on. So it is my belief that God is trying to convey a message today. That is my belief. I am 100%. I'm not doubting that whatsoever. Isaiah chapter 60 verse 1 reads, Arise, shine, for the light is come, and the glory of Jehovah is risen upon thee. So again, the call is to arise and shine because Jehovah's glory has risen upon us as a people. Isaiah 52 verse 1 reads, For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people, but Jehovah will arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Who, I'm sorry, does this passage here remind you of another passage of scripture let us read it again for behold darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the peoples but jehovah will arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee it reminds me of revelation chapter 18 notice what we read there and after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was what? Lightened with his glory. So as we receive the light that we just read, the Jehovah's light rising upon us or shining upon us, we will reflect that light, just like the sun. It shines on the, on the moon, and the moon reflects its light, correct? Regarding what took place during the midnight cry of the 1840s, we read the following. The angel who unites to in, the, in the proclamation of the third angel's message is to lighten the whole earth with his glory, a work of worldwide extent and unwanted power is here foretold. The Advent Movement of 1840 through 44 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. The first angel's message was carried to every missionary station in the world, and in some countries there was the greatest religious interest which has been witnessed, which has been witnessed in any land since the Reformation of the 16th century. But these are to be exceeded by the mighty movement under the last warning of the third angel. So what took place in the early 1840s, the movement here at the end of the world will exceed what took place then. That's what we are told. And I want to be part of that movement. But as, we, as the word itself says, Movement. In other words, I must what? 
move. Correct? She also said, This was the midnight cry, which was to give power to the second angel's message. Angels were sent from heaven to arouse the discouraged saints and prepare them for the great work before them. The most talented men were not the first to receive this message. Angels were sent to the humble, devoted ones and constrained them to raise the cry, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Now notice that this was given to the devoted ones or the devoted class. Those entrusted with the cry made haste and in the power of the Holy Spirit sounded the message and aroused their discouraged brethren. This work did not stand in the wisdom and learning of men, but in the power of God. And his saints who heard the cry could not resist it. The most spiritual received this message first. And those who had formerly led in the work were the last to receive and help swell the cry. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. She also said, a great work is to be accomplished in setting before men the saving truths of the gospel. This is the means ordained by God to stem the tide of moral corruption. This, and this is his means of restoring his moral image in man. It is his remedy for universal disorganization. It is the power that draws men together in unity. So again, a great work we are told is to be accomplished in setting before men the saving truths of the gospel. An experience of mine is the following. I went to Mexico and I'm not criticizing what I'm, the brothers that I was with. As we were traveling back to California, actually, this is what we did. We went to Mexico to visit a small congregation there. And um, a lot of, some bags of clothes was taken. And the, our, our activity there was the following. We got there. Uh, I didn't speak. I was just invited uh, by the brother that was with me and another brother. And so I was in the back seat. So we got there. We got off. We greeted everyone. And we spent the rest of the Sabbath there. Um, so I didn't participate at, um, at all. Anyhow, um, the Sabbath school was given. A uh, uh, discourse or talk sermon uh, was given. And then we had potluck. And after that, well, I think we had another evening meeting, and then we, we came home. But before we came home, of course, the trunk was open, and we, you know, there was a few bags of clothes, and we handed them out so that the church there could distribute it. On our way back, um, one of the brothers received a call, and as he was conversing, I was not really paying attention to his conversation. But he did mention in his conversation, we're coming back from TJ from doing the work. And as I, as I heard that, I literally, well, I'll be honest, I shook my head. Because yes, that's, you could say that's part of the work, but that's not the work if you understand what I'm saying. I just explained to you what, what I did, and I didn't consider that the work. Well, what's the work? Notice this statement. To present these truths is what? Is the work of the third angel's message. The Lord designs that the presentation of this message shall be the highest, greatest work carried in our world at this time. So according to this statement, to present these truths is the work. Who, I'll ask you, needs these truths? 
Everyone does. But I dare to say that those out there need them, right? They need these truths. And notice the statement was written what year? 1899. Are we late? Are we aware of the time? Because she said, greatest work carried, out, carried on in our world at this time. Romans chapter 13, verse 11 reads, And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Knowing the time. Do we, in reality, we can, let's be honest with ourselves, do we know the time? Is it really high time to awake out of sleep? Or can we slumber just a little more? Hit the snooze button. Five more minutes. We just, as everyone knows, we just flew to Virginia. And um, when we got there, we, w we left early, maybe about 5, 6 o'clock. Um, our departure was at 11 o'clock. So we figured, well, let's have plenty of time, right? Because the LAX, I haven't been there in years, but I can just assume it, there's crowds of people all over the place. And the last thing you want to do is be late and miss your flight. So we left with plenty of time. And we got to... Um, my wife's sister's home, and she travels frequently. And it was about 8, eight o'clock, so we still had about three hours. She said, Go, well, let's just hang out for a little bit. We'll leave here in a bit. Well, it got kind of late. And, so and her husband said, it's, I believe she, he said, it's 9 o'clock. In other words, you need to get going. So anyhow... It, I guess they were working on a, on a lane or two, so it was very crowded. There was traffic for miles away. And I can see, or I can hear, because I was not sitting in the front, but I can hear her concern, like, we might be, we might. This, we, this might cause you your flight. And as we got into the terminals, you know, there's different terminals, and we finally got to ours, um, I can see my, my wife kind of anxious. And so, we, I mean, we had been praying. I said, if we miss it, it's because God wants us to miss it. So anyhow, um, she finally decided, I'm going to get off. And I saw her, the urgency of her um, trying to make it on time so that we won't miss our flight. Praise God, we didn't miss it. But the point of this story is, do we, do we feel the urgency? Do we know the time? The only reason why we knew we were running late is because of our surroundings. We were, we're not going to make it. Look at the time. Are we seeing what's taking place in our surroundings? And are we looking at the prophetic time or at the prophetic clock? Words pointing that tells us we need to wake up? I hope so. We have a work to do. Awake, awake. Put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth they shall no more come into thee, the uncircumcised and the unclean. Again, awake, awake. O Zion, we are told. Haggai 2.4 tells us, Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith Jehovah, and be strong, O Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and be strong, all ye people of the land, saith Jehovah, and do what? Work, for I am with you, saith Jehovah of hosts. Who's with us? The God of heaven. 
He's with us. That's an encouragement. We're not alone. Even so, let your light shine, Jesus said, before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. That ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crook and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Again, we are to shine, arise and shine. And of Christ we read, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby that this day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. So we see that Christ, this was his mission, to shed light upon those who sat in darkness. What was the apostles, Apostle John's testimony? What did he have to say? Notice. And the word was made flesh, he says, and dwelt among us, and we beheld what? His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. When I read that, in the context of what I'm um, sharing, it reminded me that we, or for those, the people out there, should see who in us? Christ. Because this was John's testimony. We beheld his glory. And when they see us and we share the truths of God's word, whose glory are they to behold Christ. A serious responsibility. Now, this is not um, easy to say, but it's a very serious responsibility, nevertheless. And I'm going to share some passages and statements with you. Here we find the first one in Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 6. I'm sure that you are all, all aware of this verse. But if the watchman see the sword come and blows not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity or sin, or he dies in his sin, his, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. What is that telling us? That if my neighbor dies in his sins, and I never warned him, who's guilty? There's blood where? Remember what Paul said to the Jews when he preached to them, and they rejected? What did he say? My hands are freed from what? Your blood. All we have to do is just share. Do you agree? That's what we are told. Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 6. What is it about the watchmen that do not give the warning? There are watchmen that don't give the warning. We read, His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark. Sleeping, lying down, loving to what? Slumber. Hitting the snooze button. The charge against these watchmen is that they are all ignorant. I ask, ignorant of what? Perhaps the time. Because we just read, and knowing the time. So these watchmen, and in reality, that's, that, that's exactly what it is. Those who feel, as a matter of fact, there's a lot of ministers that they won't allow you to touch on prophecy. Revelation 13, events that are taking place in our world today. 
Because they say, you're going to alarm the people. You're going to scare the people. They are ignorant of the time. Otherwise, they wouldn't say such a thing. And Isaiah uses stronger language. Our responsibilities are exactly proportioned to our light, opportunities, and privileges. We are not living in the age in which our fathers lived. God gave them treasures of wisdom, which through the manifestation of his spirit and through the testimony and example of his children from generation to generation have come down along the lines to our time. We have all the light which they had, and additional light is continually shining, and we will shine more and more, and will shine more and more, until the perfect day. This generation is responsible, not only for all the light that God has imparted to past, to the past generation through his spirit and word, but for the more abundant light now shining. We cannot be accepted in honor of God and rendering the same service and doing the same works that our fathers did. In order to be blessed of God as they were blessed, we must be faithful in improving the increased light as they were faithful in improving the light that God gave them. Our Heavenly Father, we requires his people devotion and obedience according to the light and truth given them. And his claims are right and just. He will accept nothing less than he claims. All his righteous demands must be fully met or they will remain in force against the transgressor. So his commands, a demand is a command. Would you agree? And all his commands must be met. Oftentimes, we hear, when we hear the following, um, a forgotten commandment. What comes to mind? The Sabbath, correct? Well, here's another, a forgotten commandment that was uttered by the lips of Christ. Go and make disciples of all peoples. Well, that's the pastor's job. Is it really? Remember that you are working. You know the answer to that. (laughs) Remember that you are working for time and for eternity. Heavenly angels are commissioned to cooperate with your efforts for the conquest of souls. More earnest efforts should be made to establish the truth in various localities. And there must be no covering up of any face of our message. The truth for this time must be given to the souls ready to perish. Those who in any way hide the truth dishonor God upon their garments will be the blood of souls. Pretty powerful. I shared with my wife when I read this, I shared, look at, look at this, I said. Remember that you are working for time and eternity. Heavenly angels are commissioned to cooperate with your efforts for the conquest of souls. And if I'm not out trying to recruit people for God's kingdom, I said, the angel is just idle. Because he's sent with a a mission. He's sent to cooperate with me for the conquest of souls. I can't not imagine an angel idle. Can you? I found that quite interesting. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in whom of whom they have not heard? 
And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. I don't know how you became an Adventist Christian, but I know how we came in touch with the message. And it was because of one elder, elderly lady who knocked at our door. It's been a while, but it really, I mean, I can't explain it in words. I just said to myself, if sister, if the sister would have never knocked on our door, where would I be? I can tell you with all honesty, it is a privilege to know this message. It is a privilege. And I am thankful that that elderly lady, and she wasn't up in age, I don't think, but to me she seemed because I was just a child. But I am very thankful that she decided to knock on our door that morning. Even though the devil used me to discourage her. She established Bible studies with my mother. And I remember one day she came. And she said, is your mother home? And I said, no, she's not. That we have family here. We're all busy. I told her that. She said, okay, let her know I came by. But she knew who was at work. She didn't see a little young kid being disrespectful. She saw Satan or his angels at work. Next day came, she was back. Praise God for that. Let's not get discouraged from what we see. We're fighting. We're involved in a spiritual warfare. Don't get discouraged by someone slamming the door on you or someone that doesn't receive a piece of literature from you. Don't get discouraged. They're not doing it to us. Right? If we possess the spirit of Christ, well, we will do as he did. We, and we all need courage. A lot of us are very, we shy from that. We, we, we really don't like that, to share or to preach to someone. Perhaps not preaching, but witnessing to others. We shy from that. But there are many ways of doing it. We can carry um, little tracks. PHM has plenty of them. We can get some, and if you're afraid to sometimes witness, pray about it. But what you can do is that wherever you're maybe at a gas station or, I don't know, at a clinic, leave a little small track. A little, leave a book. Plant seeds. What do you say? Of course, there's booths. There's house-to-house -house ministry. There's street witnessing as well. But we must all do something. Remember that we are told a working church is a living church. This reminds me of a conversation I had with a brother about a year ago or more than a year ago. What, what is a Laodicean? What determines if we're Laodicea? What determines that? My doctrine? What I believe, I know thy works. If you read verse 14, it's speaking to the Laodicean congregation, the church. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would if thou were cold or hot. So what determines if we're Laodicea? Our works. I know your works. What is the viewpoint of Christ on this? Notice what he said. I must what? I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. 
the night cometh when no man can work. Do you believe that? That the night is fast approaching and the time is coming where we won't be able to work? I believe that. I believe it. And um, I hope and pray that the little that you have heard today may all have fallen in good ground. Remember we read, Jesus himself said, those that hear my sayings and, do, and does them, he will be what? He's like a what? A wise man who built his house upon the rock. But if we hear his sayings and we don't do, do them, in other words, it comes in through here and it goes out through here, we will be considered by the Christ and his, heavenly, and his Father foolish. So again, don't be discouraged. I, I'm, I've been around where people are very embarrassed to share. But leave tracks. Take tracks with you and drop them off in clinics, anywhere. Scatter the literature like the leaves of autumn, like we are told. So that we can become or increase or grow and the movement which has been predicted can become a reality. What do you say? Again, I told you earlier I want to be part of this movement. And it is my desire that every one of you here can also be a part of that movement. Amen. If we all work together. We heard earlier that last Wednesday there was a meeting and conversations and ideas were exchanged in order to carry and and give progression to the work. Well, let's join in. What do you say? Let's join in. The more we have, the more workers are involved, the sooner we will accomplish God's work. And the sooner we do that, the end will come. I invite you to kneel with me, if you can, to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. I ask that you give us your spirit, for it is your spirit that we need. Amen. Your mind, your life, your everything. As you have said, not with might, nor with sword, but by your spirit. And that is what we need, your spirit. Please uh, bless our efforts. Help us in the areas that we need help in. Give us the courage that we need to accomplish this task. Amen. And that you, when you come, when Jesus appeared in the clouds of heaven, even prior to that, he may find us working. I thank you, dear Father. And I ask that you continue to be with us throughout the rest of this Sabbath day. In Jesus' name, your Son, I pray. Amen. Standing on the Platform of Truth Pioneer Health and Missions <laughs>